Hello, everyone. Hello, I'm Tim McHenry from the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City, and welcome to the Art of Self Care, a program we've specially devised to help not only healthcare workers and providers um, who have been dealing with the pandemic, but also may be of benefit to um, those of us who are also suffering from uh, all sorts of other stresses related to the situation. So we all track the figures, don't we? Uh, 7.3 million cases of COVID-19 um, in the United States alone, uh, over 208,000 deaths, uh, of which New York City reports 249,874 cases of infection and almost 24,000 deaths. And we are now, after what seemed like a gradual decline in new infections since mid-May, we're seeing a 57% increase from the average two weeks ago. So the pandemic is far from over and the flu season is shortly upon us. So when the virus hit New York City hardest in the spring, there was a group of professionals who did not go into lockdown, they went into work. Uh, they were our doctors and nurses and support staff in the hospitals and hospices. They made enormous sacrifices for us. And I'm honored to welcome two of them here today to this conversation hosted by the Rubin Museum of Art. Now, you might be wondering why an art museum would be doing this. Well, the Rubin takes inspiration from the wisdom traditions of the Himalayan region through its art. And the Rubin has long sought to learn from the health benefits of contemplative practices that these traditions bring. And uh, together with cognitive sciences, both in conversation and visitor contributed art experiences, we've spent about 15 years um, since the Rubin opened um, exploring uh, the potential benefits of these practices. And Buddhism in particular advocates for a perspective of existence that allows us to be less vulnerable to the buffeting of the pains of life and death. And today, we hope to learn some tools to great resilience from the experience of two health practitioners who are daily witnesses to life and death. Dr. Virat Madhya is an Indian American doctor born into the Jain tradition, and Chimi Abumtsang is a Tibetan American nurse. Both caught COVID-19 in the course of their duties in the spring. They were in the thick of the pandemic in New York City hospitals. They'll be in conversation with a striking new voice in the field of neuroscience, Dr. Tara Swart, who joins us from London, but she has a foot in this country, in the United States, by being a senior lecturer at MIT Sloan. And she's the author of the bestseller, The Source. By the end of the session today, uh, we hope you will come away with a strong sense of what scientifically validated practices we can all adopt to help us deal with what is ahead and with greater equanimity. So before we start, just a few um, rules of how these uh, Zoom seminars and uh, experiences go. Uh, we will be taking questions in about 40 minutes, uh, so you can address those there in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but we will be disabling the chat function for the main part of the conversation so that we can all focus on what um, these three practitioners have to tell us and have to share with us. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Tara Swart, Dr. Virat Madhya, and Nurse Chime Butsang to the conversation about the art of self-care. Thank you so much for joining us. We really salute you and your work. Thank you, Tim. And um, I want to add my voice to welcoming and saluting Virat and Shimei. And I'm so honored to be able to speak with you today. Um, I'm no longer in clinical practice, so I haven't had the experience that you've had. And I'm so keen on behalf of all of us to learn about the experiences that you had with the pandemic. And I'm going to plunge right in there and ask you to tell us a little bit about exactly what you do, which, which department of the hospital you're in, and, and the biggest challenge that you faced during the first three months of the pandemic. So let's start with you, Virat. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me and uh, thanks to the Rubin Museum uh, and Tara for putting this together and Tim as well. Um, you know, I'm an ER doctor in the Bronx and the Bronx is a borough in New York uh, that sits kind of north of Manhattan. Um, it is one of the most diverse um, boroughs in New York City, 
Queens, Brooklyn, and, and the Bronx are some of the most diverse uh, boroughs that we have here in New York City. And so uh, the hospital I work at is in South Bronx, which is um, a socioeconomically disadvantaged part of New York City. Um, uh, the median income is far below what it is in Manhattan and other parts of New York City. And so I work in the emergency department there in South Bronx and uh, worked the entire COVID pandemic there in the ER. Um, I would say that my, the most difficult part for me during the three months that I, uh, you know, that was really intense in the emergency department for the COVID pandemic was, um, there was the chaos of it all. Um, I think the veracity in which the pandemic hit, uh, especially the Bronx, um, was so hard and so fast that no one really had time or the ability to um, prepare and adapt the way that we normally do. Now, an emergency department is incredibly fast paced as it is. Things move incredibly quickly. But the volume of patients we were getting and how sick the patients were um, really overwhelmed uh, even a well-staffed, well-run emergency department like the one uh, in the Bronx. And because of that, uh, we had to relinquish a lot of the things that, um, you know, we held on to as providers that gave us some solace and some peace in uh, such a chaotic environment. Um, and specifically, you know, the thing that I think was the hardest for me was, you know, we had ambulances coming in constantly, lines of ambulances coming in, every single bed was full of patients. And all of the patients that were coming to me in the section that I was working were the sickest of the sickest COVID patients. And so um, many of them were dying and many of them I had to pronounce dead. And of course that's difficult. Um, pronouncing anyone uh, dead is incredibly difficult. But one of the practices that I have maintained throughout my career has been taking a pause with all of the staff around me when someone passes away. Um, not only as a way to acknowledge the incredible efforts of everyone in the room, whether it's nursing, respiratory therapists, doctors, pharmacists, the janitors that are cleaning up uh, the mess so you can see another patient, um, but also to acknowledge that a life has passed and to give a break in the storm of chaos that is an emergency department. And usually it's anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute where I pause the whole code room and, and the code room is where we do all of those intense procedures and, and uh, life-saving measures. Um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we couldn't do that. There was no time. In fact, often we were running simultaneous codes. We were taking care of multiple patients at the same time who were all getting intubated or getting coded or being pronounced dead. And so we lost even some of the abilities to acknowledge those who pass away um, and also acknowledge the work of, of the um, healthcare staff. And that was really tough for me because it was just this continuous onslaught of 12 to 14 hours of, of you know, patience. Yeah, I re that really resonates with me because I look back now and I think that, you know, maintaining the dignity of the patients, whether they were suffering or dying and, and the people who were there looking after them was, it's kind of like in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're maintaining their dignity, then you're pretty much doing everything else right. Um, Obviously, you know, I mean, I've worked in a busy emergency room as well, but the thought of not having that 30 seconds to do that is just so painful. And so I really get that that's the sort of existential challenge, despite the fact that you have so many physical and practical challenges to deal with at the time. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Shime, we'd love to hear from you as well, exactly which department you work in, which hospital, and um, what your biggest challenge felt like in that first three months. So Tashi uh, Dalek, everyone, and thank you, uh, Rubin Museum, for this uh, event. And uh, I work in New York City 
hospital, one of the city hospital. And uh, I work in a cardiac telemetry unit. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the pandemic, uh, the biggest challenge was, you know, we are not prepared for this uh, pandemic. So we don't have any like uh, di direction what we have to follow. So it was in the mid March. So in the beginning, they said that it's just the uh, uh, droplet and then we don't even uh, know that it's an uh, airborne. And then, and then I was told that we are not allowed to wear even the mask. So, and I was floated during that time, I was floated one time to the neuro observation room. And then I had this very, very sick uh, uh, three patients. And then I don't have the tech to help uh, uh, to assist me. And then I, all day I was you know, helping and assisting those three patients we have, which were very sick. And then that time I had only the, I don't have even the mask. I was just using the uh, gloves, wearing gloves, and then uh, taking care of them all day. So at the end of the shift, you know, two of them got uh, fever. Mm -hmm. And then, and the second day, I, I got the patient with a COVID positive. So that time I use all the PPE. So the thing is that during that time, we don't have any, you know, uh, straight direction what to follow the protocols. So that was the biggest problem. And then the other thing is there is lack of information about this, you know, pandemic mm -hmm. and also the uncertainty of this disease process, the fear, anxiety, and, uh, you know, the, uh, so that all adds up. And not only that, you know, so as a nurse, I have to go to the hospital to take care of the patient. And then at the same time, I, I feel the responsibility to protect my own, you know, family members. Mm -hmm. So the first step that I took was, you know, I, I myself quarantined <laughs> to one of the room and then protect my family from, you know, uh, exposing to this pandemic, uh, this disease. Mm -hmm. So that was my first step. And then even in the hospital, you know, everybody was like fear, anxious, and then uh, the uh, patient nonstop coming. And then, you know, uh, so there is a fear within the healthcare workers. And then at that time, so I, what I felt was, you know, I thought, you know, I'm, it's sure that I'm going to get this, uh, you know, uh, COVID. And then the, so my philosophy was, you know, I'll do whatever I can to protect myself. Even if I get it, then, you know, the risk versus the benefit, the benefit of helping or taking care of patient is like such a joy, even with like, nobody wants to go in into the room where the patient is like uh, the positive pa patients were. And then, you know, expose ourselves to that, you know, patient. So like little thing like, like cold ice water, <laughs> giving them the cold ice water, that was a big thing. And not only that, the patients themselves were so terrified. They don't know what they are going to be, you know. And then there is no treatment that time. And then there is no, you know, specific, you know, medication that they are going to have. So that was like, so like uncertain and the fear anxious was, that was the biggest problem. And then what I felt was the helplessness because there is no, you know, specific treatment. There is no, you know, direct information, no, very less information that time in the March. So, and then and at the end of the <laughs> March, I got, you know, COVID. And then during the COVID also, you know, the even uh, I was very much involved with the Tibetan Nurses Association, New York and New Jersey. And then when I got uh, COVID and then I was quarantined in one of the hotel. So I found uh, a, a task force during that time, that was the beginning of the pandemic. And then everybody was so scared, so, you know, anxious that, you know, they don't know what to do. So they are locking themselves inside and then there is no direction. And then we've, 
you know, uh, created that task force with the Tibetan Nurses Association, with the Tibetan uh, New York and New Jersey Tibetan community. So, and then we keep, and then we keep getting calls. Some are like real, having real symptoms. Some of them are all because of the anxious, uh, the, they were anxious. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so in this way, you know, I was trying to uh, involve myself with the community at the same time, you know, although I have this uh, COVID and then, um, and what during that time, what really helped me was uh, the Shanti, there was uh, one of the Shanti they was teaching. So, uh, you know, because I don't know, there will be a, during that time, there will be a treatment or not, but the, the teaching that helped me most was if the problem can be solved, why worry? So I did everything myself to protect, you know, not to have this thing, but I was exposed and then I got this disease. But, and then uh, if the problem cannot be solved, worrying will do you no good. So that really helped me to, you know, uh, be more positive and then more involved with even taking, I was sick, but even taking care of the uh, other, you know, people. The sick people. Um, easier said than done, she may. <laughs> if Laurie <laughs> won't help you, why, why do it? Um, but you know, the science behind that is very much that you know this is an unprecedented global um, pandemic, obviously, and it's created a low-grade stress in everyone, let alone healthcare workers, where obviously there's more acute stress as well. And that means that the levels of our stress hormones, cortisol, become high, and they become higher than they should be all the time which erodes our immunity, but let alone that, what I'm really hearing from both of you is, apart from the obvious physical threat, just the chaos, the fear, the uncertainty, the anxiety, what that does to our stress levels and the levels of that hormone that then actually shut off the blood supply to our higher centers. So you were able to keep accessing that higher center and understanding that worrying on top of everything else would actually cause more problems in your own system and in your community and in your ability to do your job. So that's absolutely beautiful. Thank you for reminding us about that. Um, Vera, do you have a top tip for us like that? What was the one thing that got you through the chaos? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I live in the East Village, which is about a 45 minute train ride to uh, the Bronx. And, you know, most people don't like uh, commuting generally. And then during the pandemic, people really didn't like commuting because they were afraid of the subway and all that type of stuff. Uh, but for me, the subway car um, was my 45 minutes there and my 45 minutes back of just complete silence and peace. Um, you know, I, I would clear out a subway car because they'd see me in my scrubs and everybody would scurry off the subway car and, and uh, go to another one because they thought I was going to give them COVID. And um, so oftentimes I would have an entire subway car to myself and uh, I would, um, I wouldn't read. I wouldn't listen to music. I wouldn't play on my phone or anything. In fact, I would just kind of stare off into outer space a little bit. And I must have looked like I was crazy, but uh, it was 45 minutes of, of peace. And especially on the way back, um, a way to shed some of the weight uh, that um, we were all carrying. And to be honest, a way to shed some of the guilt. I think one of the hardest parts for me was the immense amount of guilt I felt as a doctor not being able to save so many people. And um, no matter what we did, you know, we would, we were trying things day to day, you know, we would intubate early and, you know, everybody would die. And then we'd intubate later and everyone would die. We tried all these different treatments and everyone was dying. And, uh, you know, you go into healthcare, you become a provider to save people, to help people. And when that is taken away from you, when you're not able to do that, um, or, or you feel like you're not doing that, um, and you're seeing so much 
death and so much morbidity from a disease that you know nothing about, uh, it was, it, it induced a lot of guilt. And mm -hmm. so um, that 45 minutes on the train, that 45 minutes of silence really allowed me to, to shed a little bit of it before I, before I came home. And so you said that you didn't read and you didn't listen to music and I, I get that. I also didn't, you know, you sort of think, oh, well, you know, I'll have so much time for reading now because I'm not commuting or whatever. But, you, you, you know, I, I felt like you that I couldn't do that and that I, I needed to not be doing something all the time. So what did you or do you have a specific practice, whether it's from the Jain tradition or not, to was it just looking out of the train window or do you have a, a particular practice that you use to clear that mental space shed that guilt etc you know um something that my mom does a lot of is uh breathing pranayama she she does a ton of breathing exercises and she she has like an hour in the morning and like an hour at night she's really really dedicated to it and something that uh, I have learned from her is the power of breathing, even if it's not a conscious breathing exercise, but just rhythmic, consistent breathing. And when you're working a 12 or 14 hour shift in the emergency department and things are absolutely crazy, you forget that you don't breathe a lot and you don't breathe deeply. And it's something that is so counterintuitive, but you know, you'd go entire stretches of the day without eating or going to the bathroom or even breathing and um, just having a consistent breath pattern was really powerful for me uh, on the way home. Yeah, so you, you say that it feels counterintuitive. Actually, the evolutionary exam, sort of uh, reason that we do that is that our threat response is about running away from a physical predator. Now it serves us to breathe shallowly when that's the case, but in the modern world where, as you both so clearly described, the threat is much more psychological or social, um, like fear, uncertainty, chaos, it does not serve us to breathe in a rapid or shallow manner. So it really, we do have to be mindful to overturn that. And so one tip that I found is um, my, my GP suggested that I buy a pulse oximeter now, I've been using this to teach my husband, who's not medical or nursing at all, the difference that it makes when you breathe deeply. You know, you put it on, hopefully you're 98 or something, but that if you take a few deep breaths, you can see it changing. So, you know, that's a very practical tip from me. But Chime, I'd like to hear a bit more from you. Um, I'd like to throw a stat in there. So Virat said, you know, you forget to go to the bathroom, you forget to breathe. We know that in normal times, the nursing population get more kidney stones than the average population because they don't have time to drink water or they hold it in before going to the bathroom. So what practical and spiritual things did you do to stop yourself from worrying and to make sure that you were looking after yourself so that you could continue to care for patients? So whatever you said is very true. <laughs> in the beginning, you know, we, you know, we think that just after this patient will go to the bathroom, then it, it, keeps goes on 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 and like after three o'clock you know I just realized that I didn't drink at all and I didn't even go to the bathroom for the whole day so so what I learned now is you know in the beginning of the shift I prepare myself I come to the uh, hospital to the unit a little more earlier and prepare myself drink enough water and then you know so uh, the biggest help that you know I had was like self-reflection what I was doing and then also the mindfulness that really helped you know what you know I can do even entering the patient's room so you know I prepare myself because I don't want to expose too much to the you know the, the COVID patient and at the same time I don't want them to get you know less care so whatever they need before entering the room, I prepare myself, ask the patient from the door what he or she needs and then what medication, everything I prepared uh, beforehand. And then uh, when I enter the room, then I give whatever they need. And then also, uh, you know, from uh, also I express, you know, what they need. And then even mental wise, 
you know, emotionally. Before the COVID, we have, you know, this uh, family visit and all this thing, but all of a sudden, nobody can visit them. And uh, at the same time, you know, they have this uh, disease and uh, no mental, uh, the emotional support from the family members. So it's like, a, it's too much for them too, not only, you know, the caretaker, the patient themselves is going through a lot. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so preparing oneself ahead is very important uh, in my experience. And then uh, uh, also the, the other important that I learned is the, the joy of, you know, uh, helping others. That is like a biggest reward. And then it pushes me more to, you know, do like go beyond my limit. So if you understand the situation that they are going through and they are experiencing and also the anxiety, uh, the fear that the family member has. Or even like if I give the like a little example that we uh, had, like we, we have this task force, uh, New York, Tibetan New York Nurses Association, New York, New York and New Jersey Nurses Station, Nurses Association. So there is a very sick patient. Now he was on ventilator and the family, you know, as a Tibetan uh, culture, if the patient is dying, we usually have like monks reciting the prayers and then blessing before they, you know, depart their, their soul. So we have all this, you know, tradition uh, of, you know, doing this, but during this pandemic, the people are dying. We don't have that, you know, opportunity. So what we did was uh, we, through the Skype, we arrange the, uh, arrange the Tibetan monks to do that kind of prayers. And then even, you know, uh, giving the phone recorded prayers and listening, keeping uh, near the patient before they die, before they take off on ventilator. So like this kind of little thing, you know, it's so beneficial for the family member and also for the patient. So this kind of thing, you know, so. This is amazing, Shime. This, I mean, it takes a, such a level of mindfulness to be as selfless as you're demonstrating that you were and you are. And it brings to mind a quote from the Buddha that as a, as a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist, I love because it really brings together the body and the mind, which is it's our responsibility to take care of our body because if we don't, we can't take care of our mind. And I think for doctors and nurses and other healthcare practitioners, that's such an important thing to remember because we need you to keep doing what you've been doing. Um, what I'd like to ask both of you next, and I'll start with Virat and then I'll come back to you, Jime, is at least the level of uncertainty has got to be less going into this flu season than it was in, in February and March. So given that, if you like to call it slight advantage that we have, what do you suggest in terms of physical self-care and spiritual practice for healthcare workers and just people in general who might be afraid still um, that we can do going into this next flu season. So let's start with you, Virat. Yeah, I mean, I think we are in an advantage in that we've had several months um, to understand this illness a little bit and understand what works a little bit better than, than what doesn't uh, in terms of medical treatment. Um, we know now what works in terms of prevention um, and I think those things are really important to adhere to. Um, could you, Vera, could you actually say what those things are just in case everybody doesn't know? Yeah, so definitely, of course, wearing a mask prevents uh, the transmission of, of airborne and droplets that can transmit the illness. Staying home if you feel ill or having a fever is incredibly important. Um, and also, uh, we now know the demographics that are, are most uh, heavily uh, hit by this um, uh, pandemic. And so uh, our elderly uh, patients and patients with comorbidities need to be extra, extra careful and continue the quarantine as uh, the, the fall and winter come through. Um, and our, our younger patients need to also be very vigilant as well about who they contact and 
and the elderly people and sick people they come in contact with as well. Um, I think from a spiritual standpoint, one of the things that has really struck me about this is, um, you know, we live in an age where despair and outrage and sadness um, really sells. If you look at our newspapers and social media and everything, it is what has really been the most, I guess, disappointing part of this all is how much people in the media have relished in the horrible parts of this and, and infect and spread to everyone. And, you know, you talked about it earlier about how that raises our cortisol and raises our um, stress hormones and makes us more susceptible to infection and mental illness and depression and anxiety. And so the one thing I'd like to share and, and one thing that we're doing at our hospital for our doctors and nurses and, and other healthcare staff is really trying to maintain some type of um, Optimism is not the right word, but at least unity and, and some, some sort of semblance through this and that we're not just privy to the despair and the outrage and the screaming voices of television and newspapers and radio. And so going into this, it's gonna be tough and we're gonna have an uphill battle ahead of us, but I think we work best when we come together and we, um, you know, we acknowledge the bad parts and we say them out loud, but then we also acknowledge what we're going to do about them and the power of unity through those struggles. 100%. I'm so glad you said that. I actually, um, for a completely different reason, recorded an IGTV on optimism today. And by coincidence, an article that was in the New York Times in June has been um, put back to the top of the website because it's been so popular and it's about why are some people more resilient than others? And you've both mentioned things already that really contribute to this. I actually made some notes because I really wanted to make sure that we covered this. And I'd love to hear from either of you about any of these points. And Elise will make sure that this, um, the link to this article is made available to everyone. But one of them is optimism and striving to find the positive within the negative, which I think Shime also gave us such a beautiful example of. Another one is having a moral compass that guides your decisions, which you've both given us so many examples of. Um, something that's very much to do with the Rubin Museum is a belief in something greater, which doesn't have to mean a religious or spiritual practice, but it can, and being part of a community, which Shime has you know, particularly spoken about. I think what you've really spoken to is about being altruistic and having a sense of purpose, which as a doctor, you know, obviously is very ingrained in you, but it would be so easy to be distracted by all that stuff that you just talked about that's out there. Um, so it's also about looking for accepting what you can't change and finding meaning in what you can change, having meaning and purpose and having a social support system. But as Chime said, focusing on supporting others as part of that, not, not only looking for the support for yourself. So um, Chime, could you tell us now um, answering the same question that Vera did, what, how you, you seem to do it so well, deal with any of that negativity that might be coming around or the burnout that might be affecting people who are doing the kind of caring work that you're doing? So it was really overwhelming that time. And then what uh, helped me most was, you know, self-reflection and then also compassionate for those suffering patient feeling compassion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every life is precious. And then the suffering that they are suff suffering during that time, when you imagine that, you know, all the tiredness, <laughs> everything, you know, become less. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, understanding or uh, like feeling their suffering that really heals uh, my, you know, the tiredness or all the, you know, uh, my suffering. And then, and uh, also now, uh, it, as uh, Dr. Virat said, you know, it's now we have, we learned, we have more information about this pandemic. We are not much more prepared compared to, you know, during March and uh, February, but still, you know, if, uh, I, I think that, you know, as His Holiness says that if you cannot help others, at least don't harm, you know, 
others. So that is a very you know important message. So you, during especially this time, if you know we each an individual, each of us has like a responsibility, you know, to take, not to give this pandemic and not to get this pandemic, like you know this uh, COVID. So it's a huge thing, and. Awesome. Uh, I think, you know, if you live in the way that you both do and that we do, you know, the, the members and community of the Rubin Museum, then you're not wearing a mask to protect yourself, you're wearing a mask to protect other people. And I just find even that way of thinking about it as so helpful in terms of being optimistic because you're not worrying about yourself all the time, you're actually thinking wider than that and I was I, I must have been reading a lot of the New York Times this week because there was a, an article that caught my attention because it was about strategic napping in the army so having small rest which I think as doctors and nurses we're very good at doing already because we have to um, but as I read deeper it wasn't just about sleeping at all it was about visualization journaling gratitude and I even I was shocked to see the quote that in the army are using this understanding the interconnectedness of everything and everyone and so I think you've both put that so beautifully that's what's come across to me is the thing that's really kept you going through this um Sarah, can so, I add one thing to that about yeah. the unity um is it's not only protecting ourselves and our people by wearing masks um one of the things that uh I think you know Chime can probably speak to as well is you know I think the pandemic was happening and everyone was looking at the medical community and saying, okay, well, this is kind of their fight, but this is all of our fight together. And um, it's really important that we get involved, um, all of us together, and that everyone is, is participating. And, it, it's, and in the ways that are necessary now, we know so much now about who is being affected by this. Um, we know that black and brown people are dying at twice the rate that white people are dying. We know that socioeconomic class is one of the strongest predictors for mortality uh, from this illness. And it is not enough for us to sit back with that information and clap at 7 p.m. for our healthcare people. We have to get involved. And so now that we have the information, we can't unknow it. And so I guess my uh, urge and plea is yes, wear your mask and yes, about why this pandemic is affecting minorities in such a way and poor people in such a way. And once you know that, get involved and demand justice and healthcare for people so we can avoid this whole thing going forward. Um, it's really hard for me to work in the Bronx and see so many people die um, that could have been saved if they had preventative health care. Um, you know, I, I don't want applause and I don't want pizza sent to my ER. I don't want flowers. I don't want any of that. I want health care for my patients. And so if we're going to be together, if we're going to go through this together, if we're going to practice unity, we have to start expecting all of us to get involved and start making demands for uh, justice as it pertains to healthcare. Hundred percent. I mean, we have a very different system in the UK, as you probably know, for healthcare. But we see exactly the same statistics that you just mentioned. Um, so combining, so we correct me if I'm wrong, but the statistic that I've seen is that in the lower socioeconomic classes, the death and infection rates are five times discrepant between white and black and ethnic minorities, and even at the highest socioeconomic class there's still a twofold difference between um, white people and black and ethnic minorities. So, you know, there's something there around uh, living in extended families, you know, having overcrowding, not, not understanding why you need to wear a mask, not having access to the best healthcare, like Chime said, not having a thermometer at home, um, things like that. There are some small things that can make such a big difference, but obviously at a policy level that the people like us need to be shouting louder about the things that need to be done to make a difference to that. Um, I wanted to round up, I think we're almost ready for Q&A and I can see a few questions by um, just quoting a piece of scientific research from, um, I'd like to call her my friend, but I've only met her once, but I, I have a huge academic crush on her, Amishi Jha. Um, she did a huge study um, with the US Marines where 
when they were preparing to go into battle, they went through a um, eight to 12 week um, mindfulness program. And I knew about the research. I knew that the people who did mindfulness prior to going into battle had increased resilience on the battlefield. But I didn't know something that she told me personally, which is, of course, there were some people that said, I'm not into mindfulness. I'm not going to do meditation for 12 minutes a day. I'm not engaging in this. So they went to battle and they found out that their colleagues were able to sleep. They weren't sweating with anxiety every day like they were. So they called up Amishi and said, I want to start this meditation thing. And what she found was that even people who started meditation in the middle of being in battle with no prior preparation saw improvements in things like stress and cortisol levels, ability to sleep, um, ability to control your emotions and, and override your biases. So I think, um, you know, we've, we've heard from both of you who obviously have been born and grown up with some of these practices very much as part of your life, as have I. But pe for people who that hasn't been the case, there's so much research from the science that shows that if you start now, it can make a big difference. And even if you start when the flu season is well underway, it could probably still make a difference. So it's really worth um, looking into these resources. So Tim, do we have some questions from the audience for Shimei and Virat? Uh, we, we've, yes, we've had a couple of questions um, in, and I've got some questions of my own too, but uh, 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 because this has been such a stimulating and important conversation and has been touching on uh, the very essence of the Buddhist teachings and uh, in which interconnectedness and understanding the nature of how everything is interdependent um, is, is really the core understanding, um, which enables you to have a perception of the things, the vicissitudes of life, the things that come at you um, and handle them in a way because you have an understanding and you're not surprised out of, and you don't become defensive um, and you don't, uh, you know, raise your cortisol levels in the process. Uh, so there's something really interesting in the, in the practices and, and, and thinking here that really um, might be the thing that addresses one of the questions that came in, um, which uh, was how powerful do you think we are in creating a mental model of staying healthy that we can actually prevent being susceptible to the virus by taking a mental stand that we can create a barrier. And now that's, that will probably elicit a number of different answers. I can well imagine, I mean, already the sort of power of suggestion, placebo effect, all these things, um, these are, the, these are suggestive states that um, actually change you. Um, but I'm really interested to hear um, the science behind that, um, Tara, and then also what the experience has been in the field from Virat and Shimi. Well, I'll just, I'll set the scene to um, get the experiences um, from Virat and Shimi. So basically what that's talking about is the bi-directional brain-body connection. And even though we've had sophisticated scanning techniques for over two decades now, because of what we believed historically, there's still a feeling that what we think and feel is separate from what goes on in our bodies physiologically and vice versa. But actually, if you, we, you know, we've all talked about optimism. If you create a mental model of health, of well-being, of a barrier, whether it's a spiritual or a physical barrier between you and the potential threat, it has a tangible impact on the levels of certain hormones and the activities of certain glands throughout your brain and your body. And these, so there's something called neuroimmunoendocrinology, which is basically the connection, and you could even say psycho neuroimmunoendocrinology, the connection between your mind, your brain, your immune system, and your endocrine system, which is all of your hormones. So basically it's better to create that mental model of a barrier. Again, like I said, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, because it may boost your immunity. It may change the levels of hormones in your body that could be implicated in being susceptible to or more um, protected against any uh, virus or pathogen. So that's what I'm going to set the scene as, as a phys physiological sort of element to it. But I'd love to hear from both of you. Chime, should we hear from you first? Uh, uh, so, 
Yes, please. Yeah. Do you want me to repeat the question? So um, how powerful do you think we are in creating a mental model of staying healthy that we can actually prevent being susceptible to the virus? Um, oh, the question just jumped. Tim, can you read no. that out? I've lost that uh, question. Yes, well, actually, um, uh, the, the, it sort of uh, went to being answered, I think. Um, the, the question from, from uh, one of our visitors is, how powerful do you think we are in creating a mental model of staying healthy that we can actually prevent being susceptible to the virus? Vera, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, you know, I think that there is a plethora of evidence that shows um, the powerful effect of placebo, of optimism, of exercise, of music, of meditation, of, of all these things that we now know can um, increase the overall healthiness of a patient. So absolutely, I do think that the mind plays a very powerful role in our overall regulation of the human body, our health, our immune system, and our recovery for things 100%. And I think it's the reason why um, certain demographics may face a more uphill battle if you are day-to-day -day stresses of making ends meet, of affording food for your family, of making sure your family doesn't get sick. Um, you know, those are going to have powerful effects on your mind and your um, resilience. And so I do think that there is even an unspoken uh, privilege of being able to work from home and avoid things. You know, if you are a house cleaner or a, a subway worker or um, a food delivery man who has to go bike from house to house to deliver food to people, um, you're going to be more worried about bringing that virus back to your home and infecting your children or your parents or your uncle or your aunt. And so I definitely think that there is a powerful way for us to um, use our mind and, and optimism to maintain our immune system. Um, and I think we're seeing some of those differences in that multivariable kind of effects between who's getting really sick and who's not. So let me extend that question and ask another one of the questions that I've seen now to Chime, which is you, taught, you, you gave us that beautiful phrase about not worrying, but how do you practically not worry if you have physical things to worry about if you're that food delivery guy, for example. Can you give us the techniques that you use to actually not worry, even if you feel like you are in a situation where it's actually sensible to worry, if you know what I mean? I mean, I know you two were absolutely in that situation, but for people who can't think of ways to do that, could you give us some, some practical tips you may? Yeah, it's, uh, so, you know, I always think that, you know, for example, uh, you know, preventing oneself and, you know, prevent getting, uh, you know, giving that to other pe uh, people. So you have to, you know, from your part, I always, you know, think that you have to do 100%, like, you know, simple thing like wearing mask and, uh, you know, doing all these precautions. And then, you know, if, if, still because of the environment or the condition, precondition, if the patient or any people gets it, then we can't stop. That's like, you, know, we cannot solve that. So each and every individual, if they, you know, do their own part 100%, and then, you know, we shouldn't be worried. So- I think what all three of us are saying is that if you worry, you know, more than, a natural small amount, you may actually be impacting your immune system in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, the worst case scenario is that you get COVID, um, mm -hmm. there are now more things we know about what we can do about it. So it's actually really beneficial. And I would say meditation is the answer to that, to reducing worry, mm -hmm. um, to, to try to keep your hormone and immune system in the best, best possible state so that if you do get it, your body's actually able to fight it better. But if you worried yourself into such a poor physical state, which we know mm -hmm. can happen, then yeah. it's it's not going to help when the worst, you know, if the worst outcome right. is inevitable. Yeah. So exactly when I got that you know, COVID, and then I realized that there is no treatment. And then what I did was, you know, I was calming myself down 
uh, and then at the same time I was taking the vitamins and then doing the breathing exercises and then you know so I was trying to do as normal as I was before uh, physically and the, at the same time I was like you know I really felt the preciousness of the life during this uh, pandemic season uh, the time you know so and it calms me down and then at the same time whatever you know uh, additional medical uh, support that you get that is the additional thing and then most important thing for once you know part is you know calming your mind and then uh, we can't see we lost she may we have but but <laughs> Uh, I'd like, uh, before she, um, uh, while well, she's trying to work to <laughs> come back on again, um, I'd love to uh, hear from you, Tara, and this this uh, works in with, with maybe uh, what something she may well want to tell us, is you've written a lot in your book, uh, The Source, about visualization, the power of visualization, and, and, um, and that's a mental construct. Um, mm -hmm which uh, repositions uh, a concept of reality in different terms. Mm -hmm. And I, I, what role can visualization play in uh, being a tool towards greater resilience in, in, in stressful circumstances? Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's a form of meditation. Um, and particularly in the medical arena, I have seen people use it with, with good success when they're enduring chemotherapy. Um, not just to endure the process that they're going through, but also to visualize, visualize a good outcome. So it really goes back to what Vera was saying about optimism, that if you visualize something, particularly if you're in a meditative state, your brain doesn't differentiate that much between what it's experienced as reality and what it's experienced in your visualization. And particularly if it's a consistent, regular, repetitive practice. So if you consistently visualize yourself as being healthy in future, as having a strong immune system, as being resilient to whatever life might throw at you, whether it's you know, a psychological uh, fear or anxiety or a physical threat to your safety, then it goes back to what I was saying about the impact on the nerves and hormones throughout your brain and your body that are so intimately connected to our immunity. But, um, and I think, you know, that's a, I love that it, it's kind of, in the given circumstances, it feels like a bit of a luxury for some people to say, okay, I'm gonna go and visualize being healthy and happy. But I can give you some really practical, physical things that you can do first that will set you up well for visualization. So it, it does actually go, oh, Chime, hi, you're back. I was just gonna say, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. At the beginning of lockdown, I did worry and I probably took every single vitamin that you could and everything that everybody said you should be taking that could, you know, boost your immune system and but I did what you may said and I worked on not worrying over worrying doesn't actually help you to stay well and be better and I pared it down to some important things I would say probably the one most important thing I would suggest is taking a good quality probiotic for four to twelve weeks it improves the quality and diversity of your gut bacteria and there are some strains that actually have what's called a psychobiotic effect which means that they have an impact on things like anxiety, insomnia, um, even, even depression. So there are studies that show that people have been able to reduce their dose of antidepressant medication or even come off it. So if you do something that's just like taking a pill or a little drink every morning, that really starts to boost your whole brain body system. Then something like visualization feels like something you can do. If you're, if you're worried and stressed, it's really hard to do it. So it's important to set yourself up well particularly speaking to what Virat said, and please back me up here, Virat, um, for the darker skinned people, it is absolutely essential to start taking vitamin D straight away if you haven't started already. Um, anyone who's deficient in it should take it, pretty much actually anyone should take it as we go into this flu season. Um, there are studies that show poorer outcomes um, in terms of getting infected and potentially dying if you're deficient in vitamin D. So there are small things that we can do to reduce our worries. Once we've managed to contain them to a certain extent, bringing in a consistent meditation practice and then maybe extending that to visualization, 
I would say is a really great little package for looking after yourself as we get through the next few months. And I'd love to hear again from both of you um, about any experiences with that. Chime, we sort of cut you off, so should we have you back? Well, I think Chime actually has a great example of visualization right behind her because uh, this is the sort of painting that you're likely to encounter at the Ruber Museum, uh, mm -hmm. which is all about uh, a projection uh, into a, um, a, a state of reality uh, that you can imagine yourself in. You, are, you know, most of the paintings of the Ruben are uh, tools really for meditation or projection uh, to enable you uh, to imagine being fortified in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chime, I wonder whether you can tilt your screen a little, your phone a little to, to show us the painting <laughs> and tell us a little bit about it. Oh. Yeah, now we can see it. Can you see more? Yes, now we can see. We can so, see yeah, it's a, this is a painting uh, of uh, Chandra Sikh, uh, 1000 Arms, the Compassion Deity. So, uh, the God of Compassion, Chandra Sikh, uh, 1000 Arms. So I, uh, you know, I meditated, uh, Genesis for compassion. And then during the pandemic, what I was uh, meditating was, uh, you know, uh, as a Tibetan, we have this culture of, you know, uh, the Mo, Mo system, the uh, di divinity, can I say the divine? The deity, I think, right, Jimmy? The, yeah. the Mo is like a divine, uh, uh, the, yeah. yeah. So that then uh, I was told by my guru that do the Vajrasattva, you know, uh, uh, mantras and then puri, you know, the meditating uh, Vajrasattva and then, you know, purify yourself, all the, you know, negativities. And then especially during that time, I also meditate on medicine Buddha. So as a healthcare worker, whatever, you know, medication I give to the patient, you know, I was praying to, you know, heal even more, you know, reciting the, uh, the medicine Buddha uh, mantras. So that's, that's my, you know, practice. I don't know how much, you know, that will, you know, make difference to the patient, but, you know, from my part, you know, I was trying to, you know, recite the uh, medicine Buddha mantra so that whoever takes that medication, you know, heals better. So it's like a, uh, positive, you know, thinking or trying from my my part. So I was during that time I was trying, you know, everything to heal that, you know, patient. So that really helped me. The purification, Vajrasattva meditation, purification. At the same time, I was reciting the uh, medicine Buddha mantra <laughs> for the patient. <laughs> I think there are some things that can't be proven by science yet, but I'm 100% sure that that helps the patient. Um, I actually learned about something from Tibetan Buddhism, which I have written a version of in my book, which is about identifying with a powerful icon. And um, in, I'm Hindu and my, uh, my name is, I'm named after the goddess of strength. And so I would identify with the goddess Tara and I would think of strength, like physical strength and mental strength um, and actually, all of my research is on mental resilience. I think even the name that gets chosen for you has some impact on the rest of your life. But Birat, tell us about a particular, um, it doesn't have to be something that you do, particularly you've told us about you know, a couple of really useful things that you do already, but something from your tradition that you think would be helpful for people at this time. Yeah, you know, one of the things that took me a long time to uh, acknowledge and really be uh, aware of was how lucky I was to grow up in a Jain household, um, especially under my father, who um, really espoused the Jain principles in raising us and recited them to us when we were kids through stories and through presentations and through talks and um, even through general advice. And I think one of the things that my father uh, really emphasized when we were growing up and even to this day is the power of gratitude, is the power of understanding no matter where you are 
there is something to be thankful for. And if you focus on the things that you're thankful for, and if you name them, if you say them and you look at them um, straight on, um, that, that gratitude can really change so much of your mind and, and your circumstance. And so no matter where I've been in my life, um, to hold on to that gratitude and feel humbled and lucky to be wherever I am in that moment um, really has been super powerful. And I think one of the things I think going forward is just maintaining that gratitude and, and naming it out loud, you know, and, and my, my sister has a great practice that, you know, she got from uh, our Jane tradition, which is before meals, she just recites her gratitudes and her children do it and her husband do anybody that's welcome at her table can be something small or big. And so um, I think gratitude is probably uh, one of the strongest things for from our tradition. I absolutely love that. And I think the naming it out loud is really, in, is really important because we can all have moments where we struggle or we don't feel like that. But um, what, what's quite interesting is, uh, you know, so from, from my tradition, I just have a pause and give like gratitude for food before, you know, so I don't even think about it now. It's like neuroplastically embedded in my brain. But so I just, I just have a pause before I start eating and I say something in my head, but it's almost unconscious now. But I had a conversation with a friend earlier today where we were saying how busy we are at work. And I said, well, you know, we're the lucky ones that have a job mm. um, and, you know, our work is in demand. And, and I had a moment today where I felt a bit overwhelmed and I thought, but I heard my own self say, we're the lucky ones because we have work and we're in demand. And it kind of, just, you know, it really helped me to get, to get over that quicker than I would have if I hadn't been saying that out loud all day. So I really agree with that. That's very powerful because you think it, you say it, you hear yourself saying it, it's impacting your brain in at least three different ways. Um, so Tim. Yeah. Do you have any questions for any of us? Well, I, I have some questions, but they're tied very much into the questions that um, our audience is interested to hear. And uh, Chima, you mentioned the Medicine Buddha. And uh, when, when the pandemic um, first hit, we at the Ruba Museum uh, really tried to think about how we could be of service and how the art that we have can actually represent a meaningful contribution to um, uh, managing ourselves during this lockdown period. And so we came up with a series of daily offerings. These were sort of short videos um, with a practitioner or an expert um, uh, to uh, take a, a particular painting and translate it into how it actually could be beneficial in the isolation that people were feeling in, in, the, in the concern and the worry. And one of them uh, was by Dr. Tony Tidwell, who is a practitioner in Tibetan medicine at the University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And she, um, she took us through uh, a, a particular, one of the many uh, tankas on Tibetan medicine, uh, which you can still see online, by the way. But it, it ties into um, a question from uh, one of our um, audience about, you know, is there an intersection of Western and Eastern medicine that either Virat or Chime um, have um, involved themselves in or witnessed um, in dealing with the pandemic or even are considering now, um, you know, for the f future? Uh, uh, so we in uh, New York and uh, New Jersey Tibetan community, we have so many uh, Tibetan doctors who are still practicing Tibetan medicines. And then uh, when we have this task force, they are also involved with uh, uh, the Tibetan doctors who are practicing Tibetan medicines are also involved. So uh, we got also from the central Tibetan government, we got all, so many Tibetan medicines uh, from India too, to uh, have that available for the Tibetan community who are residing in New York and New Jersey area. So they, are, they, they have this immune uh, booster uh, Tibetan medicine thing. And then they also have this uh, uh, infection, uh, you know, uh, redu uh, the, the reducer uh, medicines uh, according to Tibetan uh, 
medicines. So we all have this and then plus, you know, we are getting the other Western medicine. So what I noticed was, you know, the, they, uh, among the Tibetan communities, they have this strong faith and the spiritual or the cultural part that, you know, if they take it, they have this positive thought, you know, even, I don't know how much, you know, scientifically that helps the mentally, you know, it really, you know, helps and comes down than, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, uh, Tibetan uh, practice. So scientifically, I don't know how, what, you know, how much, you know, how the proof that it is helping, but mentally I witnessed that it is helping them to calm down and then they have a feeling that it is helping. And then also there are some people who are also saying that they got the symptoms and, uh, and uh, disease and everything, but just taking those Tibetan medicines, they said that, you know, they got rid of the symptom and they're feeling better. So it, I think it does help. I mean, when I was uh, still in clinical practice, if I had a patient from any community who had a spiritual healer or a herbal medicine, you know, that they were taking, I would always work with the spiritual healer, but also do my own research into the herbal medicine or the, you know, Tibetan, you know, whatever medicine it was, and just make sure that it wasn't interfering with any of the Western medication that they were taking, really explain it to them if there was a reason that you shouldn't be taking both, um, and try to work holistically like that. So I, I abs and I haven't been in clinical practice for 13 years, so this was quite a long time ago. And so I absolutely believe there is an intersection between, if you want to call it Eastern and Western or, you know, traditional and modern medicine. Um, but as practitioners, we have to take the responsibility for making sure that the patient who can't know everything about both of them is, is kept safe. And like you said, if you can't have, at least make sure that you're not doing harm. And so I think just take that responsibility. Virat, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the disclaimer that you made is incredibly important that there are, um, you know, definitely drug interactions between herbal medicines and prescribed medicines, and those are incredibly important. Um, with that being said, you know, one of the things that I think scientists and doctors are incredibly bad at is humility, is acknowledging that we don't know what we don't know. And that's very tough for us. And it's very tough for our, our scientific community. We want to explain everything. And if we don't have an explanation for something, sometimes we poo poo that thing or ignore it or dismiss it because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Um, so I'm of the opinion that treatment and cures and medicines don't just have to come in fancy bottles that a pharmaceutical company makes a lot of money selling to you, you know, or prescribing that cures and treatments can come from the earth and from nature and can come through herbs and, and, and natural remedies. And so um, just because I, as a Western doctor, don't understand that enough or uh, don't know enough about it, I'm not willing to dismiss it. And so I think it's important to acknowledge what we know and what we don't know. And it's also important um, to understand that there are, are people out there that have a lot more experience and um, information uh, with these medicines and to respect them uh, and try to understand a little bit more. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of them have become more mainstream. So I suspect that what Chime mentioned as the immune booster is probably some kind of herbal adaptogen, which you know, people can buy in health food shops now. So, and there's, um, you know, the uh, Siberian ginseng and the Korean ginseng and things like that. So, you know, I think we're getting there. I think it's improving. We're understanding more about those sorts of, of medicines as well, but there's still a really long way to go. And, and even, you know, turmeric. I mean, think, think of how popular turmeric has become and with the power of garlic and like all of these things that, you know, have been used in, you know, India and Tibet and in Eastern religions and cultures for a very long time. And whether they name it as an immune booster or, or, or whatever, I mean, they've worked. And so they've been, you know, inculcated into ritual and to food and culture for a very long time. And so um, 
I, I agree with you that I, I think it's an exciting new area and I hope that there is more of a cohesion and more of an encouragement from the West into understanding it a little bit more. Absolutely. I mean, I think Tim and Elise will know because they've read my book and I'd love you to read it. In the preface, I write about growing up in London in the sort of 70s and 80s and my mother always saying that um, turmeric could cure Alzheimer's and bowel disease and my brother and I just roaring with laughter like siblings do, you know, and then kind of being at medical school and then the research coming out about <laughs> turmeric and kind of being like, oh, I really need to go home and eat humble pie with my mother. Yeah. Um, yeah, so really interesting. I think um, my, I think my mom is watching right now, saying <laughs> the exact same thing, like you know, screaming into the computer. I told you. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's it's uh, uh, funny you should just mention uh, Tara about you know uh, being sort of um, discussing medical um, issues so long ago, um, uh, you know, as a kid and. Um, what if we've got a question about the National Health Service in Britain and what if what changes have you witnessed um, in the NHS um, and you might need to explain how it actually works because not everybody um, certainly in the United States understands that there could indeed be a universal health care system uh, although there's certainly been much conversation about it uh, what changes have you seen in the NHS and and also now sort of in the current pandemic situation, um, is there trust in the system uh, in the UK? Um, I think, you know, the NHS is a great ideal and, and it is healthcare available for everyone for free, everyone in the UK for free. Um, so that's wonderful. When I listen to Virat, it takes me back to being in the ER, you know, overcrowded, um, queues of people, people in trolleys and the corridors and things like that. Even, you know, I was, I qualified in 2000. So it's great in an emergency. Um, people, def you know, there's definitely a feeling that trust has been lost in the system, but that's not just from patients. I mean, I have friends who had no PPE at the beginning of this who, the wife got it, the husband got it, their children got it. I mean, you know, it was exactly like you two described at the beginning. Um, you know, we didn't get overwhelmed. We thought we were worried we'd be overwhelmed and we had, we'd have to make choices about who would, could get ventilation and who could live or die. That didn't happen. Hopefully we, we're better prepared now, just as you both said, we know more about how to treat it and what works and what doesn't. Not just prevention, but actually treating it if somebody does end up in hospital again. It's a really tricky one. I'll always be loyal to the NHS, but we've got issues like you do. Um, thank you, uh, Tara, for that. Uh, so we've got maybe five minutes to, to wrap up in. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, everybody mentioned, and Virat in particular, um, with the sort of tradition that he comes from was this uh, sense of gratitude and uh, vocalizing that gratitude. And I think before we end, um, it would be great to hear from all three of you um, who you would like to express gratitude for, um, for having helped you or helped others uh, through this crisis and are continuing to do so as a tribute to them. Um, I certainly want to salute uh, my good colleagues, Elise and Tarini, who've been helping with this program uh, behind the scenes and uh, you know, this is this is that that sort of collegial network of of mutual support is just so so important um, in any situation. But from the three of you, um, what groups or individuals would you like to pay tribute to? Um, well, I'll go first because actually segues from from what we were just talking about, which is, you know, I like I said, I haven't been in clinical practice for a long time, but I have friends and family who are in clinical practice, mostly in the UK, but also in other countries around the world. And these are people that I know. So I know that they were frightened to go to work. I know that they were frightened for their elderly relatives, for their children, um, but that they went to work every day. They volunteered to do shifts that they didn't have to. And I am so humbled and in awe of that. And you know, they were people that I could pick up the phone to if I was worried about I have a, a vulnerable family member. And 
I just, I cannot, you know, just speaking to Vera and Chime really just brought it home for me that, you know, I was in a job like that, but I didn't have to go to work and do that this time. Um, so I really want to thank the people that I know who I know how brave they've been as individuals. Of course, everyone in the NHS and all, all healthcare workers, but when you know the story, when you know the fear that surrounded having to just go to your job without being protected, that completely just humbles me. Jimmy. Oh, I, I would like to thank the New York and New Jersey Nurses Association uh, uh, help task. And then also I want to thank uh, Tibetan uh, New York and New Jersey Tibetan Association for you know providing all the healthcare workers who were sick and quarantined at the hospital. They are you know delivering the meals every every day for the last like three months. And not only for the healthcare workers, they also go to the different hospitals. You know they all are volunteered and then they provide food and all the necessary things. And also my family members, you know who are like every time you know coming to the hotel and then delivering whatever i need and also my co-workers you know we all were like in panic situation helping each other and then you know making calls when i was sick they were like you know how are you feeling and then the telling me the situation in the hospital updating everything so every all of my co-workers and then, and thank you, Rubin Museum, for you know, uh, bring this event. And then, thank you, Tara. Thank you, Dr. Virat. And thank you, team. Thank you, the audience also. <laughs> um, yeah. First, I mean, thank you to the Rubin Museum. Thank you, Tim, for reaching out to me, and Tara for moderating, and um, Chime for your incredible insight. Um, I'd also like to thank a few people, actually. I'd like to thank my father um, for giving me strength and discipline. I think those things growing up um, really allow me to do my job effectively and to endure some of the hardships that this job um, produces. Uh, and then I'd like to thank my mother uh, for the kindness and compassion that she instilled in me, which also allow me to do my job in a way um, I wouldn't without those qualities. Um, I'd like to thank my boyfriend, Sam, for picking me up physically and emotionally when I came back from the hospital day after day, um, bruised and battered uh, and carrying me forward so I could do another day. Um, and then I'd like to thank everyone watching um, and everyone who will watch this in advance for your support and unity and activism for health equity in this country, for um, racial ethnic minorities and for socioeconomically disadvantaged classes. Uh, we gotta do this together. So thank you in advance for, for participating. Well, thank you both so much. Um, you really, you brought the stories, you brought the, the spiritual practices and the advice um, forward. And I really hope that a lot of people watch this recording going forward and that um, the audience, I can't see you, but that you've, you've picked up a little nugget that will really help you um, to continue day to day. Tim, Elise and Tarini, thank you so much for having us and for organizing this wonderful event. And I wish I could come to the Rubin Museum sometime soon. Um, <laughs> art is such a wonderful way of of calming your mind and not worrying. So let's hope that people start not flooding back in huge numbers, but safely, socially distanced, start coming back to the museum. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the Rubin Museum, yes, is uh, has reopened and uh, you can buy a time ticket or indeed, um, if you want to attend for free, uh, you can come on Friday nights as usual. Uh, the galleries are free from uh, uh, six until 10. So uh, please try and attend if you can. And we um, are very strict about the guidelines and very conscientious about um, social distancing. So you should um, feel safe um, as a visitor. Uh, we, however, can uh, increasingly be um, visited online in the sense that we are doing our best to provide programs and access uh, to uh, people all around the world uh, to what the Rubin has to um, say about the art that um, it uh, is inspired by and has in its collection. And one of the ways is on Mondays at 1 p.m., 
Eastern Standard Time in the US, we have a mindfulness uh, practice. Uh, it's just 45 minutes long. Um, it's free to members. Uh, there's a small charge for um, anybody else, but it's one way in to uh, practice mindfulness on the basis of and inspired by um, art and our collection. And um, another way is also, um, just a second. Uh, and we should uh, mention that, um, you know, healthcare workers and healthcare providers uh, have free access to the Rubin Museum through the end of the year. So you can physically visit the museum um, without having to pay. I think that's a really important um, thing to, to be able to state. And we said that on our website. So do be clear about that. And I hope um, all of you can uh, come frequently and, and, and visit and learn a little more about what the art has to say. One way to get an introduction to the Rubin, if you um, haven't ever visited, is on October the 21st. Um, we have our first online gala. Now, a gala means a fundraiser, uh, but it is actually a free program. So you're invited to join us, and there you're going to learn about a new installation that we're preparing that follows the precepts and is inspired by um, a mandala um, a journey a journey through into the center of the mandala that um, asks you to experience um, a number of different exercises that help you understand how you can regulate your emotions and turn them into wisdoms. And uh, so if you want to learn a little bit about that, that's on October the 21st, and I hope you can join us. As I say, it's a free program. So, um, well, Tara and Virat and Shime, uh, it's been an honor to uh, share the screens with you um, in this session. Uh, this has been recorded, so no matter if you weren't able to um, experience it live, we will make it available uh, shortly after this um, to anybody who wants to access it. And if we didn't get to your questions, I do apologize, but we um, have run out of time on this session. Uh, but um, if you uh, want to leave an email behind in your registration and, and pose a question to um, either Tara Virat or Chime, we'll be happy to um, continue the conversation as best we can and communicate with you by um, our email service. Uh, thank you again so much. And uh, now let's remember some of the things we have learned today. Uh, breathe, really important, and be conscious as you breathe that you are taking everything in that exists and give it out with pleasure and honor and people will sense that in you and uh, you will make uh, the world a little bit better as a result of registering that importance and everything that connects us. So thank you from the Rubin Museum and have a safe and uh, valiant and continued successful existence on this planet. We wish that for everyone.